First off, thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks to the psychology department for, uh, I'm deeply honored to have been invited as a speaker in your uh, distinguished speaker series uh, this year. Uh, it's a very special uh, opportunity for me. I'm also excited to talk with you about the topic of today's uh, presentation. Uh, it's on a product uh, and a piece of work that I have been involved in for about five years now. I wouldn't have thought that five years from the time we started we'd be where we are right now. Uh, but uh, it's been an interesting voyage for me and I'd like to share some of that, that experience. More to the point, I'd like to spend some time talking with you about um, what we have learned about the outcomes, the therapy outcomes with this novel computer treatment program that I'll be talking to you about. And so, um, welcome to the presentation. Again, thanks for, for coming. I also didn't expect quite as full a house as we have here now, but I, maybe the rain had something to do with that. You didn't have competing things to, ha to happen, huh? Uh, no, I think you, you may have been here at extra credit and all those things. They, they whispered in my ear. My uh, goal for today uh, is to spend some time in the beginning discussing major depressive disorder and how common it is uh, around the world, actually. Uh, I want to discuss its place in primary medical practices, where it turns out that the largest majority of people who suffer from this disorder show first to their, their family practice doctor, their internal medicine doctor, internist, and the like. And you may be surprised to know that in obstetrics and gynecology, who see more depression than all the mental health specialists combined. But I hope to spend some time talking with you about uh, those settings because there are some current challenges in our healthcare system for meeting the needs of depressed individuals. And they're pretty serious challenges. The challenges don't have to do with the fact that there may not be effective treatments. There are effective treatments. We know how to treat a lot of people who have, who suffer from this disorder. Uh, the challenges have to do with how do you get it paid for, how do you get it into the settings where people show having the depression-related symptoms. And I'll spend some time talking about that. I'll also present some findings from the initial uh, investigation that really examined treatment outcome. Does this approach to treatment work? Does it enter into that, ar that array of treatments that we know already works for depression? And you might ask, well, then why do we need another treatment uh, if those that we already have work. I hope to uh, later rest some of the uh, questions you may have in that regard. And I'd like to propose how this approach might help address some of those challenges that I talk about uh, above. Now, um, sometimes, and I, I'm gonna try to work hard to not do this, my intention is not to be jargony. So if I use, a, if I forget to introduce an acronym, CBT, uh, raise your hand and say, what are you talking about? That's okay if you interrupt me to raise your hand and ask a question in that sense. Uh, I think I've practiced enough that I, I, I'll avoid that. But on any other issue too, if the question arrives, feel free, I'm comfortable uh, answering questions in process, but we'll also save time at the end so we can have a chance to have some, some uh, discussion. First of all, major depressive disorder is a major problem. It uh, creates a lot of suffering in the lives of, of people who are affected by it. Not only the people who are affected, but their family members as well. We know, for example, that mothers, moms, new moms, who become depressed, they're not very good at child rearing. They, in fact, many states uh, have uh, special programs uh, that are to identify moms who might be depressed because they're at risk of abusing their children or neglecting their children and uh, themselves, as some of you may know, depression is associated with suicide. That's not a good outcome. Uh, many people who, hey, what happened here? Was that moving while I was? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, many people uh, who suffer from depression, they also end up divorced. The uh, partners don't get along very well with a, de a depressed spouse, and so it has enormous costs. People don't work as well and as efficiently, so a lot of time off work is lost as a result of depression. Uh, research has shown both in the United States, at Harvard University, at University of British Columbia, in Vancouver, Canada, uh, quite convincingly that if employers spent a little time rehabilitating people who suffer from depression, they actually gain a lot in terms of productivity. So that work has already been done, and uh, there's good reason then to, for us to be concerned at all levels regarding uh, this condition. 
Worldwide impact, 121 million people worldwide. And some folks would say that's conservative. I've seen estimates rain up as high as 300 million people in the world suffer from uh, depression. 300 million, to give you a point of reference, <laughs> I don't know what's happening here. Uh, 300 million people, to give you a point of reference, is the number of people in a country like China who, it's a margin of error. China has a billion, 300 million people. 300 million are people that they can't track that are kind of uh, floating around in rural areas and stuff, not in urban areas and so on. It's a lot of people. It's, think about the population of the United States. They've basically lost track of the population of the United States. If that many people in the world are depressed, it gives you some sense of the proportions that we're talking about. It's also the leading cause of disability and the fourth major contributor to what's called the global burden of disease, meaning uh, lost years of productivity, disability years associated with major depression. Um, I want to give you, how do I move my cursor? On the, I have to do over here, okay. The World Health Organization gives us a little bit more clue regarding the impact of depression. And you, you, uh, the, the essential point I want to make here is how uh, the red areas up there describe uh, what is this condition. Consists of depressed mood. You don't feel very good. You feel low uh, much of the time. Loss of interest and pleasure. Feelings of guilt and low self-worth or self-esteem, some people would say. Disturbed sleep or appetite, low energy and poor concentration. And it's known that this disorder, it, it comes and it goes once it's, once it's started. Uh, and uh, the pr people are generally unable to take care of their daily responsibilities. As I said earlier down here, depression, 121 million people, leading cause of disability, can be reliably diagnosed and treated in primary care. Fewer than 25% of those affected have uh, access to effective treatments. And that really, that last point, is a large part of what I referred to as challenges before. That given that there are effective treatments out there, the, the challenge becomes how to get it to people. We know that 80% of the people who are referred from primary care to a mental health specialist, a behavioral health specialist, never make contact with a behavioral health specialist. Only 20% do. There's a breakdown somewhere in that. So it means that a large number of people are not being treated uh, for the depression. Given all the consequences that I just mentioned, it's a, it's a big concern. I think I have to get out of this with. Okay. Whoops. Why are we concerned about primary care practices uh, as opposed to mental health care practices? I mentioned earlier, uh, if you became depressed, the first professional who's likely to see you will be your doctor, your physician. Not, not a psychologist, not me, not a psychiatrist, not a, a mental health nurse. It's going to be your doctor. You'll go to them and talk about body aches. You'll talk about not feeling up to, your, up to, uh, to speed. You'll talk with them about a lot of the symptoms that comprise major depressive disorder. It's the primary care physicians then who see most depression first. And then they often will make a decision to refer to a specialist in that respect. But we know that the treatment options that are available in primary care are mainly what? what what's your doctor likely to do if you medication? That's basically what their training is to do. They're not going to do psychotherapy with you. They're going to do medication treatments and stuff. And there's nothing wrong with medication when it's appropriately used. I don't mean to be negative in that respect, but it is the only option. The reason that's important is because we know that when patients are given a choice of treatments, they tend to stick with the treatment they've chosen for a longer period of time. And that will come up again in a few minutes when we uh, talk about some of the challenges. Now, the reasons for inadequate uh, treatment has been traced to several problems. Uh, the low numbers and few types of workers who are trained and supervised in mental health care. Primary care physicians can't afford to, to hire clinical psychologists, psychiatrists to be in their practices and stuff. Uh, if, they, if they could afford to do that, maybe a large part of the problem would be solved, but they simply can't afford to do that. And so you have, uh, uh, <laughs> this thing is going to get me through the presentation much faster than I was planning on going through. Uh, 
Uh, and the doctors themselves are not trained in how to do other than write the, write the script. Uh, yet there are effective treatments uh, in the psychological intervention area. Uh, there are three, particularly and possibly four, that are known to be effective when people are provided those treatments. One of them is called cognitive behavior therapy. So when I use the term CBT later, or you see it on the board there, that's what I'm referring to. It's a therapy that involves helping a person change their thoughts about why they're depressed, and then adopting new constructive thoughts and new constructive behaviors. Interpersonal therapy <laughs> is uh, uh, another, uh, ther another approach that's been found to be quite effective. When I say quite effective, that means it's withstood the test of rigorous experimental t uh, investigation, uh, clinical and experimental investigation, not just somebody thought it was effective or it worked on two or three people who, s who gave a testimony, but scientifically it, they've been investigated. Uh, another one is behavioral activation therapy, or otherwise known as behavior therapy, that I'm going to spend some time talking about today. We know those work. Traditional psychodynamic psychotherapy has also been uh, found to be useful with uh, this disorder, major depressive uh, uh, disorder. Um, the, the only new information on this slide is that uh, primary care physicians prescribe upwards of 7 to 80 percent of all psychotropic medications, including antidepressants. And in fact, the number of prescriptions written for antidepressants is much higher than that in primary care because many of those prescriptions are written for problems that really aren't depression. So if you go to your doctor and you say, I have some PMS, they'll write an antidepression uh, prescription for you. If you go to your doctor and say, I'm just having these vague general body complaints, they are likely to write an antidepressant prescription for you. Uh, interesting, did that happen again? <laughs> Interestingly, um, the, although the, the number of prescriptions written for antidepressant medications has gone up in the last uh, two years, to the uh, last, last 10 years, sorry, about seven years actually, uh, to the tune of about $2.5 billion worth, the increase in antidepressant prescriptions, depression goes undetected in primary care. That is, the proper screening and diagnosis simply isn't happening. So this is a testimony of how much money is being spent or earned from the pharmaceutical company's point of view, earned regarding uh, the use of antidepressant medications and so forth, that uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a billion dollar industry in that respect. But we do know that antidepressant medications can reduce depression symptoms and that it's premature uh, discontinuation. When people stop taking the medication before they have finished in a, uh, a treatment course, uh, they're at risk for relapse, that is the problems the depression will, will uh, recur. Uh, several studies have addressed this issue and one of them showing that 30 to 83 percent of people who began an antidepressant discontinue treatment prema uh, prematurely. And they do it for various reasons. Some do it because the side effects are so strong. Uh, and we'll get a little bit into some of the side effects we'll see from, uh, from an actual uh, advertising, uh, advertisement from a, uh, a pharmaceutical website. But uh, some people simply stop taking it because they don't want to take the medication or they never get the prescription fi uh, filled. And so, it, the challenge there is how do you get the medications to the people where it might otherwise work. There is a large body of literature also beginning to show that they work mainly for more severely depressed patients, not moderate and mild, uh, mild uh, uh, depression. This is an, another study that uh, showed that 21% uh, discontinued the medication within two weeks of uh, initially filling a prescription, an additional 3% to 10% discontinued every two weeks until only about half still took the medications at four months. This is a challenge in primary care. So even though most depression presents there, and the only treatment option often is medication, then it's, it's a problem if people aren't taking the medications for whatever the reasons. Another study, less than half of the patients taking an antidepressant fill more than three prescriptions, an indication that treatment is not adhered to for more than three months. What about psychotherapy as an option? Well, I mentioned that there are several proven uh, psychotherapy uh, approaches. Some people prefer medications. Uh, some people prefer psychotherapy. And we know, as I said, that when people are given a choice, they often will stick to the treatments that they subscribe to. This is not fair. I'm giving you the punchlines before I get, intend to get to the, the punchlines. So ignore the slide when it goes forward like that. Um, the uh, the evidence, in fact, is so strong for many of the psychotherapies, notably those that I spoke about, that in guidelines that are issued to professionals about how best to manage depression, 
they are recommended as frontline interventions at, uh, for, and particularly for mild and moderate depression and even for severe depression for those therapies that I mentioned. That is, frontline means that they should be offered to the person first or along with a medication where medications are indicated. So there's uh, pretty strong uh, evidence for them in that respect. Yet only 20% of patients referred, as I mentioned, ever make it to a mental health specialist. Uh, patients often continue medication treatment when it is combined with psychotherapy. That's the other part of the puzzle here to think about, is that if a person is in psychotherapy and they also are taking medications, they're more likely to continue both the medication and the psychotherapy. Now remember that I said for the more severe depressions, medications have found to be uh, uh, quite useful in reducing symptoms. So for those people, if they had psychotherapy along with it, then people are more likely to continue the, the medications. <coughs> now this is another challenge, is that fewer psychiatrists, psychiatrists uh, you may know are people who have medical doctor degrees, MD degrees, and then they go on to uh, develop a, to a, a specialized training in psychiatry for an additional three or four years to become psychiatrists. Uh, it's during that time, that uh, advanced training after the MD degree, that they learn uh, how to do uh, psychiatric work. And uh, that's where they learn specifically about psychotropic medications in, in some detail. That is their sort of holy grail, their expertise. But fewer of them are being trained in psychotherapy. There was a time when uh, a large percentage of them were also being trained in psychotherapy and in medications. That has changed uh, significantly. In fact, there's a concern within the psychiatric profession and in the mental health professions in general about this decline. Only 10 to 11 percent of psychiatrists now get training in psychotherapy. Uh, that's a big change from what it, it used to be. And in fact, uh, with that other data I was saying about the increase in antidepressant medications to the tune of about $2.25 billion, the, uh, the amount of psychotherapy is going down uh, in the face of continuing need for, for depression, and that decrease is mainly because psychiatrists are dropping out of uh, providing it. Um, there are reasons for that, and I'll just uh, suggest one to you, just pragmatically speaking. Uh, with the advent of certain psychotropic medications, there are models that seem to at least suggest how they might work. They're not all proven uh, very well yet, but um, uh, that involves how to adjust neurotransmitters, those uh, neurochemicals that, uh, that work in our body so that the body can best utilize them to counteract depression. Uh, psychiatry training, it seems, has, uh, and people who enter psychiatry have taken a greater interest in how to upregulate and downregulate those neurotransmitters than in psychotherapy approaches. Now, why might that be? If you came to my office, if I was a physician, and I could earn, say, $175 for a 12 or 15 minute contact with you and write a prescription at the end of that, or I could earn $60 from an insurance company or Medicaid or Medicare for spending an hour with you doing psychotherapy, raise your hand, who wants to do the $60 version of it? Now, there's a couple of people here because they want to do, you know, they want to help people in that sense. Most of you didn't. I gather that means you want to earn $179 for the 15 minute uh, contact. Uh, that accounts for some of the $2.5 billion uh, and the, the, the ready use of it in that respect. There probably are some other reasons as well. Another possible solution, several possible solutions, integrating behavioral health care into the primary uh, care setting at what's called the point of care. When your doctor is talking with you and you're describing these symptoms that you may have uh, and they don't have the time to spend that hour with you, if there was a person who they could hand you off to, called a warm handoff to another behavioral health specialist, that would be a way in which they could deal with, with uh, the depression in a way that offered choices. They still may write the script, but uh, they may offer other treatment alternatives as well. That warm handoff approach would be one way to do that. That's generally called a, uh, <laughs> that's generally called a collaborative care model uh, and those have been tried in various places around the, the country, in some places here in town, in, in Grand Rapids, in fact, where uh, uh, specialists are placed uh, at the point of care with the uh, primary care physician uh, in order to uh, address these problems. However, when they've been evaluated, these collaborative care models, uh, they're of varying quality. There's poor communication reported between the primary care physicians, just what the PCPs stand for here, 
and the specialist in that all of our training as, as specialists, my training as a clinical psychologist, psych psychiatrist training as a psychiatrist, and the primary care physician's training as a primary care physician is what has come to be called silo training. That is to say, we weren't jointly trained with each other to know how to help each other well in these different situations. And so if, if the primary care physician refers the patient to me, I'm likely to want to manage the whole case myself. I, I don't remember. I need to contact a primary care doctor because you've got a visit coming in uh, next week or two weeks, and they need to have information about how your treatment is going. That problem, whether it's with psychiatrists, nurses, psychologists, social workers, is a poor communication problem that exists. Cost as well are among the continuing issues. Uh, cost affects the sustainability of the model. Uh, so uh, it's not clear always that insurance companies, Medicaid, Medicare will pay for that combination of specialty training. And so that's a challenge for our current, uh, uh, the collaborative care model. Another approach has been the use of care managers to better reach patients in a natural setting. Care managers are like paraprofessionals who, are, who may work with a mental health specialist, some of them community college trained, and they're trained to go into the home and to, into the home or other natural setting, a work site uh, place, and to work with individuals who are depressed, but under supervision of the mental health specialist. And that supervision may take regular phone contact, increasingly web contact, uh, but it's important that they work closely with a professional. The intent is not to make them therapists or to make them psychiatrists, but it is to give them some basic uh, guidance and supervision as to what they do with, with a person. Often it is, for example, to make sure that they're taking their medication, that they got the prescription filled, that if there are side effects, they can communicate with the doctor and get information about how to deal with the side effects. So they're not becoming professional mental health people, but ways of sustaining the treatment itself. I have a collaborating research site at the Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in the uh, state of Oklahoma, and they have a system in their child welfare system where they actually are working with depressed moms that I mentioned earlier, where they, these kind of care managers go into the home and work with these moms to not only with depression, but sort of managing their lives in general in sustainable ways. And uh, that's, they found quite separate from depression that to be a useful approach to working with, with folks. They've extended it now to depression. In fact, they are a research site with me because, oops, because they're using uh, the, the computer program that, I just, that I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes. On a laptop, they go in, they sit with the, the, the moms, and they go through the program week to week. And uh, so they're evaluating it in that context. Many states have such home visitor programs, particularly in the postpartum period for moms. Um, there are some challenges to the, man to the care manager approach. If you can get a job for seven, eight bucks an hour working in that context versus working in some other context that might be more desirable, you will change jobs. Uh, we've had that happen in Oklahoma, in fact. Uh, we get, do training, and then somebody leaves. We have to retrain again. Somebody leaves. Uh, everybody's looking for the best job opportunity, a few more bucks, and so forth. That happens a, a, fair, a fair amount at uh, jobs of that sort. Uh, the evaluations are still out regarding whether or not uh, this model will work from an effectiveness point of view, but also there's a question of its acceptability to families. Uh, is it okay for you to come into my, ho my home, sit and talk with me about depression? Is it okay for you to come to my home and help me manage my life in some way? Maybe for some people, maybe not so much for other people. Those evaluations are still out. Some of the other proposals, uh, better and more extensive training for the primary care doctors, the family practice doctors, the internal medicine doctors, the other folks, uh, to do behavioral health intervention. For example, teaching them how to screen for uh, depression. That's a big issue in medical care now. Grand Rapids is one of the leading sites in the country for uh, getting doctors just to begin to monitor for depression on an ongoing, regular basis so that they have information, data about how depression symptoms are changing. This condition, I'm telling you, is a very important one, and health insurers and other people are very, very concerned about it, about young and old people. Uh, teenagers kill themselves, adolescents, when they're depressed. Old people sometimes kill themselves when they're depressed. There's a good reason to be concerned about it. Uh, to get the primary care doctor to refer only to more serious cases to behavioral health specialists has been another proposal. Yet expert evaluations of these approaches have not been positive, much like the collaborative care model that I, that I mentioned before. Uh, 
Uh, if the additional training that a doctor get, gets after they've gotten their medical degree, or for that matter, any specialist, any professional, if somebody came to me and said, I want you to start doing something different, and I'm going to train you in how to do it, if it didn't occur in my primary training, in my case, clinical psychology, there's a good chance it's not going to make it to my, whoops, my actual practice. I may do it for a short time. I may try. But most often, I'm going to go away to the workshop, come back, and not do it. We see that happening all the time in postgraduate training. People pay lots of money sometimes to go to a workshop and learn a new technique, but it simply doesn't transfer into their, their practice. Same with the primary care uh, doctors. Uh, some of us have taken the view that we've got to begin to do joint training during training. So if I'm at a university that has a medical school, my doctoral students need to work shoulder to shoulder to the primary care doctor so that they learn how to communicate with each other during training so that they come out then understanding what we do with respect to each other and the importance of, of uh, working together. Uh, among the, the primary care physicians, family practice doctors, the literature shows, the research shows, are better at communicating about issues like depression. They actually will spend time talking with you about your life rather than simply writing the script. The internal medicine people, uh, the, the research shows, tend to want to write the script and uh, deal with things in that way. This is a book that offered uh, a final set of recommendations on how to deal with chronic disease, and in the case I'm going to use is depression, psychological approaches to chronic disease management. And this was a set of recommendations in the chapter on uh, how primary care doctors can um, uh, be better at dealing with depression. It said, prescribe an increase in pleasant behaviors. Teach patients how to substitute realistic thoughts for pessimistic ones. Uh, evaluate their anxiety. Uh, evaluate the current alcohol and, and substance abuse. Uh, prescribe exercise. Teach them assertiveness skills and so on. Teach them to read books about depression. You get the idea that uh, these are things, I mentioned a 12 to 15 minute encounter. I don't know how long your doctor's time is, but mine is about 12 and a half minutes or so for which I write, I don't really write the check, but the insurance company is about $179. It's, uh, it's not likely that they're going to do all that in 12 to 15 minutes. That's a challenge. How do you squeeze all, they would be speed wrapping much faster than I'm talking this morning to get through this presentation in order to make that, that, uh, that happen. Uh, so it's, it's unlikely to, to happen. So this is simply a quick summary of what I've already talked about, uh, cost and other issues that uh, make it difficult to treat depression, but it takes us back to the topic of today. Although these are well-meaning approaches, um, there's increasing evidence bearing down on the, the use of antidepressants uh, and supporting psychosocial interventions. There's good reason to believe that there are some other alternatives that might uh, work better. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, to some extent. Uh, many uh, once referred, it's an interesting complex question, many once referred at some point, but there's a trailing off of those who are referring because they know that it's not going to lead to a connection. So that's dropping in that respect. And then of that 20% who make the contact, that's the group that you've got to remember. They either don't fill a prescription, they fill it a few times and stop doing it, or they stop taking the medication. So that's the situation we're, we're in in terms of the, the reality of uh, of uh, those, those 20 percent. Let me uh, move right along to, are there any other questions up to this point yet? Did I see a hand? No. Um, let me show you uh, an introduction to the program that I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about. Um, it's called Building a Meaningful Life Through Behavioral Activation. The short acronym, affectionately, we call it BAML, Building a Meaningful Life. Uh, this introduction overview will spend some time giving you a pretty firm idea of what the treatment program is about. It's an interactive multimedia treatment where you, the person sits down in front of the computer and that follows guidance from therapists who are real therapists actually. They watch patient examples, people who are really actors, but they act the role of patients about how they struggle with depression and how they went through a similar program. Uh, it should give you an idea of uh, what, it's not the actual program, but it's an overview to give you an idea of what. Good. 
Can everybody hear okay? My name is Karen Levine. Welcome to my home. And welcome to Building a Meaningful Life Through Behavioral Activation. What a strange name for a therapy program. And what a strange place to be talking about it. In my kitchen. Well, the name and place is more appropriate than you might expect. You see, Behavioral Activation is a therapy program that involves the common, everyday experiences of your life. Let me explain. You know better than anyone else that depression is a terrible thing. You know that depression affects your relationships, your work, everything that you do. This is precisely the point. It's the everything that you do, all the daily activities that make up your life, is really where depression thrives and grows. I know that you feel bad inside, but if you're able to recover from these terrible feelings on the inside, you have to deal with all of the common everyday things on the outside like tending to relationships, going to work, or even cleaning up around the house. In other words, overcoming depression is a, a lot like working in the kitchen. Our time together today will introduce you to this unique therapy called behavioral activation. And it will give you some ideas to what you might expect should you choose to participate in this program. We have a lot to talk about, so let's get started. Some people have described it as a darkness that covers every aspect of their life. Others have said it is like falling into a dark hole. Depression is a mixture of sadness, loneliness, and hopelessness that can affect anyone. One out of four people will experience depression in their lifetime. One out of ten will suffer from it in any given year. It is a common illness that is experienced by people regardless of their race, sex, family background, class, or educational level. Depression can express itself in many ways. It can feel like an empty restlessness or an inability to do even, even the smallest thing. It can numb your emotions or bring uncontrollable tears. Its symptoms are sadness, loss of interest in the things you once enjoyed, problems with sleeping, weight gain or loss, fatigue, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, and in the most severe cases, thoughts of dying. Depression can be triggered by a divorce, a death of a loved one, the loss of a job, or it can appear seemingly out of nowhere for no reason. Sometimes one does not even know when it actually begins, but simply feels that it has been with them for a long time. Some believe depression is related to a chemical imbalance in one's brain. Others feel that it is passed down in your family through your genes. No matter what the causes of depression, it is important to know that it can be overcome. Some people find relief from depression by going to therapy. Others make additional progress by taking antidepressant medications or by joining a support group. Some people turn to family members or friends or seek help in religious circles. The program you are about to begin provides yet another option for dealing with depression. It is a unique way to learn from professional therapists and patients who have experienced depression on your own and at your own pace. By using this computer program, you now have one further way to deal with your depression and begin to get well. Behavioral activation is a therapeutic approach based on a simple idea. Your behavior, how you act throughout your day, affects how you feel inside. Let me give you a quick example. I just finished doing the dishes. Some therapies suggest that I wash the dishes because I felt good inside and was motivated to do so. Behavioral activation reverses that idea and suggests that motivation or the positive feelings you have inside comes from actually doing the work. Let me put it another way. 
Most therapies work from the inside out. That is, they focus on your feelings or your past in order to help you change your overall current mood. Behavioral activation takes a different approach. It works from the outside in. It believes that if you change what you do, you will change the way you feel. Thinking about your feelings is only helpful if it leads to changes in the way you live, which behavioral activation believes will change how you feel inside. It's the opposite of that vicious circle where you feel so bad you mope around the house all day. It's a positive approach where you step by step change your behaviors and by doing so you change your overall sense of well-being. Behavioral activation also places much responsibility on you, the patient. It's not an easy therapy. Instead of simply talking with a therapist and focusing on how you feel and what you think, you are asked to take specific steps to change the way you live. Behavioral activation requires patience, discipline, and a willingness to keep at it, even when you get discouraged. This program is going to help you do four important things. One, learn how to recognize your behaviors and keep track of them on a daily basis. Two, understand how your behaviors affect your mood. Three, change your behaviors so that they reflect your values. And four, practice your behaviors until your new skills and activities become a natural part of a meaningful life. This program is divided into 10 sessions, which you will complete over a 10-week period. Sessions 1 through 4 will present the basic principles of behavioral activation. These first four sessions will also introduce homework assignments, such as an activity log, an exercise to help clarify what's most important to you, and several other activities that you will be working on in between sessions. Following session five, your progress will be assessed in order to tailor the remaining sessions to your unique needs. Sessions six through 10 will be a mixture of mini lessons matched to those particular needs. Four therapists will be leading this program. Dr. Amy Noggle is a veteran therapist who specializes in behavioral activation, both as a teacher and a therapist. Here are some examples Dr. Noggle has been very involved in the creation of this interactive program. Dr. Gloria Taggett is also a behavioral psychologist. She leads a successful private practice and has watched patients make steady progress using this behavior-based approach. For Dr. Evelyn Winfield, helping people with depression has been a lifelong calling. Today she spends her professional time as the director of a university counseling and testing center where she also serves as a classroom instructor and therapist. Rick Syme holds psychological degrees from several universities and has solid experience using behavioral activation in helping clients overcome depression and anxiety. Mr. Syme has researched effective treatments for phobias and mood disorders. You will have the opportunity to choose one of these therapists to work with throughout the program. All of them have a depth of understanding in helping people with depression. You can trust their wisdom and experience. Throughout the sessions, you will meet patients who have suffered from depression and who have made significant progress using behavioral activation. These individuals will offer personal insight into how behavioral activation works in real life situations. Finally, this program is about you and your ability to deal with your depression in positive and constructive ways. Every therapy requires active involvement and a commitment from each patient to work hard and stick with it, even when the going gets tough. Likewise, your success with behavioral activation will rely on your patience, your discipline, and courage. And most of all, a promise to yourself to see it through. The steps you take will be small, but powerful. But with each step, you will begin to break the cycle of discouragement that has so saddened your life. Depression is indeed a difficult thing to endure, but we strongly believe that it is something that you can overcome.
well, while this is making up its mind about whether it wants to go forward or not, let me just interject a few things. Um, it would be a mistake if you took the take-home message from the earlier part of this about the challenges, uh, and I focused a bit on medications only because it, was, it is the dominant approach in primary care. If you took as a message that people who undergo psychotherapy of any of the approaches that I talked about, that they, on the other hand, always complete their course of treatment, that would be a mistake. That's not the case. And in fact, those evidence-based treatments that I identified there, people drop out of those as well. Uh, many of the people complete, but the range can be from 25% to 53%, depending, will drop out. They'll start a course of therapy, and then they'll not finish that course of therapy. And I mention that because I'll share with you some information about the dropout from this computer program and a few other computer programs uh, that may uh, address part of the, the, so the uh, problem there. Um, those who complete tend to do very, very well. Those who also carry out the homework assignments that was talked about that Karen Levine spoke of, because all of these therapies have some kind of work to be done outside of, of session. It's firmly established now that the therapy doesn't take place in the room with the therapist. That's part of the process, but it's as important to do the work outside of sessions. And when that doesn't happen, most therapies fail. They don't work so well. So I don't want you to think that there is an anti-medication bias by emphasizing that dropout. I'm having some uh, technical problem here and moving forward. Um, any questions up to this point about what you just saw? Uh, yes. Thank you. Where, where does the yes, that's a very good question. Um, the computer programs are just new enough that the right answer to that has not yet been established, uh, but it is clear that in the face-to-face -face version of the computer programs that are out, there are computer programs on cognitive behavior therapy, computer programs now on behavioral activation. There isn't one yet that I've seen on interpersonal therapy or psychodynamic therapy. You'll see in the data that I talk about, we elected, we elected to allow people into the study only if they were moderate and severe depressed. There are no mildly depressed people in the study. Part of our reasoning was that a number of things work with mild depression. Many kinds of therapies, including doing nothing, works for mild depression. When I say works, people are in remission. They're no longer symptomatic if you wait a long enough period of time. But uh, for moderate depression and severe depression, uh, that's where you're testing the metal, so to speak. Uh, in, there's a program called Beating the Blues that was developed in the United Kingdom. That one has been tested with moderate and severe depressed individuals. And again, the sample sizes are too small at this stage to give a firm answer to your question, but it seems to work well with severe depression as well. The standard, uh, let me say it this way, the most reliable large-scale studies that have been done suggest that for severe depression, both medications and psychotherapy of the evidence-based kind are, is the recommended approach to take. Uh, a minute about the behavioral activation therapy, which is the therapy on which BAML is based. In other words, we had done a lot of years of research on behavioral activation therapy before we decided to make this computer program. Behavioral activation is a therapy that has been found in face-to-face -face variety to work very, very well. In fact, it works with people who don't do so well in cognitive behavior therapy. It takes those people and they do better with behavioral activation. It's a simpler therapy as well. It's easier to train people how to do behavioral activation therapy. In cognitive therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, you're often working with a person's thoughts and trying to establish how their thoughts may be constructive, useful, non-adaptive. And some people find that off-putting. If I tell you that, well, there's something wrong with your thinking, so I've got to help you change your thinking in the right way, as opposed to, how about let's plan a schedule of activities to do and stuff. I'm not, the, the perception is that I'm criticizing you in one sense. If I'm a good therapist, you shouldn't feel that. But nonetheless, some people may take, uh, take away uh, and leave with that kind of idea. So what does the evidence say regarding, and this is just one study. Um, well, where do I, okay, there we go. Uh, Karen talked about some of this in behavioral activation therapy. The therapist is interested in the function of negative thinking, the way that it promotes withdrawal rather than its rightness or wrongness. So we're not judging, but if your um, uh, behavior uh, leads to you 
withdrawing from life in some way for whatever reason, socially, uh, maritally, in other ways, you're likely to become depressed. And so behavioral activation is concerned about teaching you, helping you to understand, to approach situations rather than withdraw from situations. Um, and she talked about the rest of these things in terms of uh, regular routines. There's a large scale study done at the University of Washington in Seattle where 250 people were assigned to one of four groups, behavioral activation therapy, cognitive therapy, uh, medications, or a sugar pill known as a placebo. And the treatment continued for 24 months. Uh, over a four month period, um, um, they, well, the, the uh, 24 sessions, that should be sessions, not months. That's it's too long to do there. Uh, Sigmund Freud would like that, that 24 month approach. Now, 24 sessions over a four month period of time uh, using some standard measures to judge whether the treatment worked or not. Patients in all four groups improved and all treatments were equally effective for mildly depressed people, what the, the point I made a minute ago. But for severely depressed people, behavioral activation and the antidepressant drug were equal in their effectiveness. Oops. Both were superior to cognitive behavior therapy and to placebo. But patients taking the medication or placebo were much more likely to drop out of treatment than those receiving behavioral activation therapy. And remember what I said earlier about if you drop out, chances are it's not going to work so well for you. If you stay in, there's a better chance. So this suggests that for overall, the behavioral activation therapy was the most successful uh, in, the study, in this study. Uh, and they needed a little more uh, than what Karen was describing in the video in order to get them to that point. Now, behavioral activation therapy in general takes fewer sessions as well, too. The, the computer program that I just spoke about, remember, is 10 sessions as opposed to 24 sessions long, a big difference in terms of the, the, the time uh, for the patient. And most protocols that you will read about, if you ever read about in the literature, range between six and 10 sessions for behavioral activation. That's a big difference between, in terms of costs, right? Costs being the, the burden, the, one of the challenges that I mentioned earlier, you've cut down significantly on costs, even if I was hired into the primary care office, if I could do it in six sessions or uh, 10 sessions as opposed to taking that long per patient. This study was reported in a, a, a Health Harvard, a, uh, a news, uh, newsletter for professionals. So Karen has walked you through what BAML is. It was developed by myself and Dr. Amy Noggle, who was featured in the, the video, and it relied heavily upon uh, current versions of behavioral activation manuals and our own research in that area. Uh, the effects, in summary, and I'll be sharing this information, is that it reduces depression to minimal symptoms or non-depressed range after 10 sessions on valid measures. Uh, it increases positive activation of constructive and meaningful behaviors, and this is key because that's the goal of the therapy. We look at the process of behavioral activation therapy, we want to see changes in your actual behavior, those positive and constructive behaviors, and if we get that, we tend to see then the depression symptoms go down, and you'll see charts on that in just uh, a moment. Um, did it skip again on me? Yeah. Decreases in negative automatic thoughts. Now remember, cognitive therapy wants to target your your negative automatic thoughts. It wants to change those as a matter of the therapy itself. Behavioral activation doesn't target your automatic thoughts, but we notice both in face-to-face -face form and in the computer form here that those automatic thoughts change anyhow with the change in, in behavior. Uh, that's where some of the, the time savings uh, occurs. Behavioral activation also teaches an increase in values consistent behavior. One of the things that the computer program teaches is that the opposite of depression is not happiness. Many people think of uh, antidepressant medications as making you happy, or as psychotherapy, making you happy, the opposite of, of uh, we think of the opposite of depression as, as meaningfulness, a life that's meaningful to you. Nobody walks around happy all the time. I mean, well, you could if you took the right drugs, uh, street drugs or something, could make you happy all the time. But that doesn't mean you have a productive life. That's not the goal of, of psychological therapy. It's to have a meaningful life and thus the name that we attach to this, this condition. And part of that is understanding what your values are and leading a life that is consistent with your values in addition to constructive behaviors to engage in. That combination, if we can do that, we find depression goes away. In our studies uh, the, of the computer treatment, the effects were found to be positive and durable for six months after treatment. Uh, 
And in the longer, larger scale studies, like the Seattle, Washington study, for two years later, the people were not depressed. Uh, and there has been other work that shows that relapse into depression takes place at a much slower rate, up to five years, when you compare studies that involve other kinds of treatments and behavioral activation or cognitive therapy, for that matter. Uh, ten session protocol uh, focuses on the initial five sessions about the basic principles. And again, this is stuff that Karen went through, so I'm going to go through fairly uh, quickly here. Uh, patient exemplars uh, that tell stories. These were actually actors from Western Michigan University from the theater department. Those people you saw as the patient exemplars, they were all professors in the theater department. The therapists are actual therapists. They're live, real people who are behavioral activation therapists who guide the people through it. The host narrator you may have seen in West Michigan television. She also does commercial advertisements for B&A Bootery and some other shoe stores around Meyer from time to time, uh, Meyer Groceries and the like. Uh, and it incorporates session by session measures of depression so that the patient can visualize, can see changes in their, their, uh, their depression level. Uh, okay. Karen talked about this, this is why I'm skipping through here. We don't consider BAML to be self-help. It's rather to be used under supervision of a clinical professional who determines its appropriateness based on knowledge of the patient. And yet, its day-to-day -day supervision can be done by medical office staff. We actually uh, use nurses in training at Kalamazoo Valley Community College to supervise uh, the early stages of BAML. So they knew we, we trained them well. They had uh, scripts that they could use, could, could follow, but it worked very, very well, and they were excited to be involved in that. We've also used upper-level undergraduates to be involved in the, the, the ongoing supervision day to day. So it doesn't require a PhD clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist to supervise BAML. BAML in that sense is an expert system in itself. Uh, it does require the supervision because, number one, depressed people sometimes are suicidal. The program monitors suicide, gives them actual depression tests, and when there's any indication that they're thinking or planning in that way, and we ask specific questions every session, then the program stops and a person is, you know, has to sit down and talk with them, do an assessment, and then manage the case according to the doctor's office or the psychology's office or wherever it's being used in terms of the appropriate uh, protocol. And we want to keep that there. So it's not, you'll read about the internet therapies for uh, depression, for example, where there is no person contact in it. It turns out that only 1% of people who start those internet programs complete them. Most people report, in fact, that it's kind of, it felt like it was a game, like it was a, uh, a, a, you've seen those psychological tests, pop test in the back of a good housekeeping uh, magazine or something. They say it felt like that, so I didn't feel like I needed to complete it or anything. When they've added a person to it so that they have to check in about what sessions they completed, then they complete more of the sessions in that case. Uh, we think that that's an important part of the BAML experience. In this study, we enrolled 15 moderate to severe depressed people who qualified and were enrolled. Uh, of these, 12 met completion criteria and three dropped out uh, before meeting completion criteria. But those data were included in what's called an intent to treat analysis, and I'll say a word about that later when we get to the chart. The participants completed a mean number of 7.4 sessions, and that's within normal limits of research subjects participating in depression studies, and somewhat better than most. Uh, the sessions lasted on average about 45 minutes across the 10 sessions, and the range there was from uh, 5 to 10 uh, to 100 minutes. The active supervision time was about 7 minutes um, and ranged from 2 to 30 minutes. This is something about the educational level of the participants. Basically, they had uh, 11 had some college, 3 had graduate, uh, graduated a two-year uh, college or high school, and one person had a graduate degree. Uh, Income-wise, uh, most were, uh, a good number of them were on the low-income side. Uh, one person had an income of over $100,000. That's not typical of the people who went through it. Uh, in terms of employment level, uh, the largest group was unemployed. Uh, five were currently employed, and the others, three were students, and one was retired. Uh, most were single. Uh, there were none who, none who were married at the time they uh, were going through the, the study. Uh, most were white. Uh, there was one African American and two multiracial, uh, part of that racial being African American and mixed with some other 
rates. One of the scales we use to measure depression is uh, called the Beck Depression Inventory. It's simply a, a psychological test, a short psychological test that you take. That was to wake you up because I knew it would be after lunchtime, and so it was planned that, that way to those of you who were sleeping to jar you a little bit. Uh, called the Beck Depression Inventory, and I put it up here now because I want you to notice the scale there. Those people who, are in the zero, who score 0 to 13 are in the minimal to no depressed range. 14 to 19, mild depression, moderate depression, severe depression. That's important in interpreting this next chart. These were the outcomes that we found for those people who went through the, the research study. What you should look at is that these first three week, weeks were before treatment started. And we wanted to have three measures at that point because we wanted them to be stable with depression, not already getting better, because we wanted to say that the program contributed to the cause of their being depressed. In many studies, you'll find somebody that has one measure, but people are already starting to drop off, and we don't expect change to happen that quickly. So they're in some kind of a cycle of change already, and so we wanted to avoid that. But what you notice is that the scores steadily dropped out until this is about 13.9, and this is what you see, a completer and an intent to treat. Intent to treat is a kind of an analysis that, uh, without going into too much detail, you take everybody who, went to, who, who you had an early measure on and you pretend like they completed it. It's a conservative, anal conservative analysis so that you don't overinterpret the data. It means that if somebody dropped out here, we take this as their last score and we carry it all the way forward here. So it penalizes the researcher, in a sense, for using that conservative score as opposed to people who go all the way through and you get scores way out here where they're already gotten better. So that's what that ITT means and stuff. But in general, it doesn't matter in terms of this study. They're about the same in any case. And they're in that uh, minimal to no symptom range at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the treatment, which was here at 10 weeks. This is six month follow up. So they got, the uh, treatment was discontinued at this point. We measured them at post test a week later, one month, three months, and six months. And uh, those were the outcomes there. Um, this is some statistical stuff that would take us too far afield. One of the things I wanted to, to point out to you, and I mentioned a little bit earlier, is that we, we were also interested in, does BAML do what the face-to-face -face version of the therapy does? Remember I talked about activation? If we increase activation, as is happening here, do we get reductions in depression symptoms? And this chart says yes. As their activation levels went up, and notice even here where the activation levels at three months started to come down, their depression scales went up again. And then when those went up again, they came down. So there is a relationship here, and it turns out to be statistically significant, if that means anything to anybody. But that pattern was important for us to establish. Likewise, the relationship between the automatic negative thoughts and depression. So these are automatic negative thoughts, and this is depression. They're, dec they're decreasing over time at a similar rate. And the activation scores are going up. So there should be that kind of relationship, what we see in face-to-face -face therapy. It means that by increasing activation, we're causing these other changes to happen in the way that we would, would like to. And then there's always a question that researchers have to face, so what? The symptoms are going down. Who cares? What about quality of life? Is quality of life improving as a result as well? And in this case, we got a substantial and statistically significant improvement in quality of life from the pre to post to six month follow up in using BAML, using the computer program. Um, well, this is simply a summary of what I've just talked about with you. Uh, and this is simply a cleaner way to show that those pattern of relationships because we have a plot line that shows, uh, that's the mathematical line that shows the very same relationships that I just talked about. So let me just skip through these. Now, uh, depression has symptoms in various areas, cognitive symptoms, mood symptoms, and in physical bodily symptoms as well. We asked the question, does BAML affect all three of those, or some of them and not others? What we found here is that using the psychological tests that we use to measure negative affect, negative cognition, and bodily symptoms, they all change in the way that we would like to have them occur. So it's a psychological intervention, but if you think the, psych whoops, the psychological intervention doesn't affect the somatic, you'd be wrong about that. And this has been found actually in cognitive therapy as well. Um, 
this is some more demographics about previous treatments that people had gotten and then concurrent treatment. Basically, we required that they not be an in individual therapy. That's why this is zero. Any of these kinds of therapies, one person was taking at the same time an antidepressant medication. Uh, Twelve people had no other uh, treatments taking place. Our conclusions was that this computerized depression program was found to be helpful in significantly reducing depression symptoms and that the reductions were durable for six months. And the patients reported high satisfaction, 80% of maximum. Session length and degree of supervision were within acceptable limits. Remember I talked about the 12 and a half minute encounter for your doctor. If you add 10 minutes for your nurse to measure your ear, look in your ear and take the, your temperature and stuff, that's about 20, 24 minutes worth of time. That's well under what's required to supervise BAML. So they could have at a point of care an encounter that fits into the, the model, the, the, the uh, primary care model uh, quite easily in that respect. Um, it may offer a uh, convenient alternative that can be used either alone with medications, alone or with medications in primary care integrated with collaborative care so that even if uh, under the collaborative care model, we remember that one where professionals are a part of the primary care office, no reason why BAML couldn't be integrated in that way as well on a computer. Uh, BAML can be installed on a laptop or a workstation or a server for that matter if you're in a distributed system like many of your healthcare places here are where they have outpatient programs all around the city of Grand Rapids. If they had a server centrally located, where people could go to any one of those sites and the data is on the server and they could take the BAML program. Uh, employee assistance program. This has been an area where they, these people understand the cost of depression. They've done the research. They understand it very, very well. Uh, they're not in a position to do therapy, although many of them are counselors or uh, human resource people and stuff, but they could supervise a, a BAML type uh, program linked to a behavioral health specialist. Um, the research was supported by the Kalamazoo County Community Mental Health Board as well as the State of Michigan Department of Community Health, uh, the Kalamazoo Valley Community College, Behavioral Health Resources of Summit Point in Battle Creek, Blue Cross and Blue Shield Foundation of Michigan, and the WMU Office of Technology Development all provided additional support for the development of BAML and or the conduct of this this uh, research uh, that I've just mentioned. Uh, some other ideas about how it might help a professional. It certainly extends what would be an evidence-based uh, treatment that is based on an evidence-based treatment to patients who might not otherwise receive one. Uh, one of the journals, The Lancet, talks about that issue and how it's a challenge. Professional time can be devoted to more complicated cases, those severe cases that have uh, other complications. Uh, waiting list time, the, the number of people who are on waiting list to get into therapy is just, it's horrendous. At our university counseling center, uh, before they changed the format in which they are now delivering the services, there were waiting lists of one month to six weeks to two months sometimes just to get in to see a therapist. That's not uncommon in terms of getting psychological therapies. Uh, uh, that's one of the things that offering, uh, BAML can serve 200 people a year uh, for, for one installation. Uh, and that's with vacation time and, and not working on weekends, if you get the idea, then it could reduce those, uh, those waiting lists. Uh, it can be applied in primary care, uh, where estimates are those large number of antidepressants that I mentioned. Uh, and it's an affordable option where the expense of a human therapist precludes uh, uh, service. There's a large group of people in the state and actually around the country that are called underserved. These people don't qualify for Medicaid or Medicare payment for their services, yet community health agencies are required to serve them anyhow. And so it costs them, literally you can send their budget into the, into the red if they weren't careful about that, but they need to offer something because they're required to by law. Having a program of, uh, like this that could treat at least those who are depressed, it won't treat everybody, but those people who may be depressed would be certainly more affordable than having, a, again, a PhD clinical psychologist who was gonna do, do that kind of work. Uh, that was one of the interests of the Department of Community Health in the state of Michigan in funding the, the project. Uh, it extends a non-medication option, da, 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 da. You get the idea of what we're saying here. And it may possibly someday be, whoops, be used in a telehealth telemedicine. How many of you are familiar with telehealth? No? That's a situation where um, you have what's called a distance site where a professional is available, and then an originating site. You go into a doctor's office someplace, and 
that's the originating site where you're going to get help. You're going to get medical help, you're going to get psychological help or something. And there's a link between those, uh, those sites such that the, uh, and it's a live link, so that the, uh, the nurse or the staff member greets the patient. Uh, and in the case of BAML, uh, the suicide assessment manages the built-in program stops like the suicide and the end of session matters. There's another job aid that would be provided to the, the staff uh, at the distance sites, the supervisory staff. So imagine I'm at Western Michigan and I'm supervising a site in Grand Rapids. That uh, Grand, There's no reason why Grand Rapids needs me to do that, but let's say in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, the, uh, I interact over a visual and auditory connection. There's specialized equipment to do that now in telehealth. Uh, to make sure that things go well. I'm not constantly interacting because BAML is doing a lot of the work there, but if they needed me to interact, the, the staff person there on site, uh, they could, could do so. That's occurring outside of BAML. That's happening right now with doctors who are interacting with uh, nurses and other people. Australia has led the world in this regard in telehealth because uh, 30 to 40 percent of their people live in very extremely distant rural areas, and so they can't get professional medical doctors who want to go live in those areas, but they can have health workers there who live in those areas interacting with doctors from Melbourne or Sydney or uh, Queensland or someplace to get health care delivered to them. And the concept is fast growing in Michigan. I, I kind of tongue in cheek said the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, but it turns out the Upper Peninsula of Michigan has one of the most well-established telehealth programs in the country, bar none, because they also have great distances. Anybody familiar with the Upper uh, peninsula and how far you have to go to how desolate it is between places and in the winter time in fact their site is uh, very interesting because they have this huge snow mountains and stuff up there and they're saying in the winter time would you rather do, drive through this or and then they got a camera in somebody's living room doing family therapy sitting by a fireplace in a family therapy room getting therapy from a professional someplace else the easy answer no-brainer on that one is telehealth well one of the things I wanted to say, show you, is that th there are some things that BAML does not do. If you bear with me a second here. You may... Here's me, and here's my depression. You may have Before seen I this. started taking Abilify, I was taking an antidepressant alone. Most days I could put on a brave face and muddle through, but other days I still struggled with my depression. I was managing, but it always had a way of creeping up on me. I felt stuck. I just couldn't shake my depression. So I talked to my doctor. I guess it's buffering. He said adding Abilify to my antidepressant could help with my depression and that some people had symptom improvement as early as one to two weeks. He also told me about a free trial offer from Abilify. Now, I feel more in control of my depression. Abilify is not for everyone. Call your doctor if your depression worsens or if you have a... Unusual changes in behavior or thoughts of suicide. Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Elderly dementia patients taking Abilify have an increased risk of death or stroke. Call your doctor if you have high fever, stiff muscles, and confusion to address a possible life-threatening condition, or if Well, you get the idea that uh, there aren't... You have uncontrollable muscle movements, as these could become permanent. High blood sugar has been reported with Abilify and medicines like it. In some cases, extreme high blood sugar can lead to coma or death. Other risks include decreases in white blood cells, which can be serious, dizziness upon standing, seizures, trouble swallowing, and imp impaired judgment or motor skills. Depression used to define me. Then my doctor added Abilify to my... I don't need to play that much longer, but you get, you get the idea of uh, what I'm speaking of there. Um, it, we have used it to train professionals in how to do behavioral activation therapy face-to-face. -face. So we've trained psychiatric residents, counselors, psychologists, and social workers whoops, in how to do behavioral activation therapy using selected segments of BAML. So it's uh, been helpful in that way as well. And finally, as a research tool, 
uh, it allows uh, for the study of a treatment. Many people, particularly neuroscientists, are interested in the biological underpinnings of depression, studying what changes in the brain happen with effective treatments and so forth. Uh, the federal government has been interested in having cost-effective approaches so they don't have to hire therapists to do uh, those kinds of studies for, on the intervention side, and it's quite possible that uh, a program like BAML could do that. Now, we developed, before we did BAML, a group version of behavioral activation therapy, and this is simply the journal abstract in which it appeared, but the, con the possibility of doing group, admin group therapy individually administered with BAML also is open, particularly the server model that I spoke of a second ago. The current status is that the initial efficacy study is completed. Uh, it's available to Michigan public mental health agencies through an agreement with the Western Michigan University uh, Office of Technology and the Department of Community Health and the Kalamazoo uh, Community College. And this is the project development team uh, that's part of it. Uh, there were several other programmers whose names are not there. It's not, however, the first evidence-based computer treatment. There are others, and in the interest of time and possible questions, I won't go into those, but the leading countries in the world with regard to this kind of technology is the United Kingdom with a program called Beating the Blues, uh, which I won't show you the video at this time, just in the interest of time, and uh, Australia, they have a program called Mood Gem, which is basically a, a, a text manual on the internet that people read through. It's not like what you've just seen this morning in terms of a BAML, and that's the one I was saying that 1% of people who start it uh, complete it. The others drop out saying it feels like a pop psychology quiz at the back of a good, good uh, housekeeping magazine. So um, we, we asked some other research questions, but uh, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop. The long and short of this is we compared those results to Beating the Blues, a UK program, an evidence-based medication algorithm, face-to-face -face cognitive therapy, and some other uh, uh, sorry, treatment as usual that's practiced in community mental health, and BAML turned out to be uh, pretty close to the face-to-face -face CBT therapy. Face-to-face uh, -face BA therapy, however, beat everybody in terms of the outcomes there. You can see treatment as usual, actually people got 20% worse when they were prescribed a single SSRI for uh, depression. That was the purpose of the study, and I've given you the results of that study. So what's next for us with regard to uh, this computerized area and so forth? Uh, some of you may have seen the Sunday newspaper. Uh, there are stories like this all around the world showing that VA medical staff fall short, say, the professionals in that area. 70% uh, of respondents think that the department lacks the staff and space to meet the needs of a growing number of veterans who are seeking mental health care. Uh, that storyline simply continues throughout the rest of that article. Um, what's next for us in the pipeline is a scary movie. When I first saw this movie many years ago, I was really frightened by it. But since then, as I've watched it over and over again on classic movie channels and late night reruns, I find myself saying, why in the world was I ever afraid of it in the first place? What had initially scared me no longer bothers me at all. My name is Karen Levine, and I welcome you to a unique program called Living a Less Trauma-Driven Life Through Exposure Therapy. It might surprise you that I've introduced you to this therapy program by first talking about a scary movie. But there is a connection between how I've reacted to that old movie and how you react to the trauma that has so affected your life. Please know that I'm not saying that watching a scary movie is equal to the trauma that you've been through. What you have experienced is more difficult and disturbing than watching a thousand scary movies. And your trauma is real. This movie's make-believe. But there is a connection. You see, as I've watched this movie over and over again, I've become less and less bothered by it. Why? Because my thoughts and my emotions have, over time, become desensitized to it. I've sort of taken it all in and figured it all out. This is precisely what happens in exposure therapy. 
Exposure therapy is a thoughtful, step-by-step -step method of exposing your brain and body to a difficult moment in your life in such a way that it no longer controls your emotions. By carefully revisiting your traumatic memories, you can loosen their grip. Be triggered by something as simple as a smell or a noise or a particular environment. And those who suffer from it have a tendency to avoid things that remind them of their trauma. PTSD is not an imaginary illness. I'll stop there. You get the idea. Um, the, uh, we actually developed this PTSD treatment program along the same time we were developing the depression program. We've given more attention to the depression program and moving it along simply because of the demand for depression treatment over PTSD. However, we've got in the United States 20,000 veterans being repatri repatriated per month in the United States. Uh, we expect the demand for PTSD services as hinted at by that newspaper article to only increase. So we've been in an earlier kind of process stages of evaluating this program, product usability, integrity checking to make sure that it delivers the therapy we want it to, to, to deliver. But it's uh, similar but different than. You treat PTSD very differently than you do depression. But that program is, we have a, a, a approval to move forward with the same kind of treatment outcome study that I showed you on the depression side right now. And so we'll be recruiting for people to go through that uh, program as well in the coming months. Uh, so uh, without, she goes through, this is an introductory overview as well, much like the BAMA program, but I simply wanted you to, to answer the question, see what our answer to the question of what next in that regard. The principles are the same. Uh, affordability, cost, sustainability of treatments uh, that are not right now being achieved and by having at least access so that the, v the veterans are not waiting for three months, four months to get treatment if we can demonstrate that this program works. Uh, and that's what we'll be testing over the next uh, few months. Questions at this point? Any? Yes? Ah, that's a good, good question. Remember the activity report that, that was described there? The patient comes up with some ideas and that with the help of the therapist on screen who's talking about it, and they shape kind of the ideas that go onto the, onto the list. Sometimes it's simply coming up with something because depressed people don't want to move, don't want to do things and stuff. So there's a lot of coaching on how to come up with the types of issues. And then there's some, act, some activities that are better, higher quality than others. The first goal is to get them to come up with a list of activities and then to select from a few of those to start doing from week to week. And they come back in and they, the computer program asks them, so how did you do on your homework? And if they say, well, I didn't do so well, the computer chastises just a little bit and says, ah, it's very important to do homework. If they said, I did a lot, they say, good job. I'm glad you, you know, Karen Levine comes back or the therapist comes back and says something. So it has that kind of branching logic. It's mainly doing something, but there is, that's a very good question. Remember, depressed people avoid a lot of situations. So part of the, the, uh, the, the therapy in session uh, sort of commentary is about how to do something when you normally avoid it doing something, okay? Even if it's a little bit uh, uncomfortable to do so, but by that, particularly if it's consistent with your values. So we try to contextualize the doing something with their own values so that that gives it more meaning for them as they proceed to, to do it. Yeah. Good question, though. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Her question is, can BAML be used with people who have multiple psychological problems or only with those who are diagnosed singularly with depression? And our study, uh, we did eliminate some psychological disorders, but not all of them. We eliminated people who had panic disorder, borderline personality disorder because of the complexities of those disorders and their interaction with uh, depression. But it was possible for somebody to have other anxiety, the social anxiety, generalized anxiety, other kinds of problems, and we documented those. We can go back and take a look at what other disorders people had. So it's not, uh, strictly speaking, limited to just people who have a singular uh, 
uh, disorder of depression in that sense. We had people who also had substance abuse disorders who were going through substance abuse treatment, but they BAML treated them for depression. So, yeah. and there was another hand up over here. That's a very good question. The question was, uh, does the PTSD treatment program geared mainly for like civilian PTSD or were we trying to gear it toward the military? We did both. We, uh, I have a, an extended clinical and research interest in PTSD and know that how pervasive it is both in civil society but as well as the military. So you'll find Sam, a patient exemplar who was in Iraq talking about the story and his exposure to an incendiary explosive device, an, an IED, and the heat and how he was traumatized by what had happened there. So a, a veteran can see a, a familiar context for their own uh, PTSD that they may be going through. In each of these programs, a large part of it depends upon having friendly patient exemplars, people who look like me, who feel like me, whose situation is like mine. And so uh, in future years, we expect to enrich those so that we have cancer patients, older patients, and a lot of p folks uh, which from a principal's point of view may not matter because they're going to do the same kind of principles, but it's helpful like in teaching. If I use examples that you can relate to if I'm teaching you biology or statistics or whatever, it's easier for you to assimilate the information and stuff. And so our goal here was to select a wide sample enough of patient exemplars who could show how to carry out the therapy so that somebody sitting in front of the computer, at least initially, would be able to make some contact with that. But yes, we intended for veterans and civilian. There's a rape victim there uh, on here. There's uh, uh, several other kinds of uh, civilian traumas as well. Yeah. What is the extent of the uh, Yeah, that's, you're smart. You've got a research background, I think. That's a good question. He's saying, how did we pitch it? What did, they know they, what did they know they were signing up for when they came to the program? Because a lot of people stayed in it. Given the statistics I showed you about medicine and I told you about cognitive therapy that people drop out a lot, he's aware that this is a high rate of acceptance of this, this, this program. What did we do? I think there were several things that we did, and you nailed one of them. They knew because we recruited them. We had postings and we had them in, uh, in offices of where they might go, the health center and other places. They saw an interactive multimedia computer treatment program there. They didn't go to the doctor's office and, and the doctor prepared to get a medication and the doctor said, here are some choices for you. We recruited them so they knew what they were getting into in that sense. And we say in the publication version of this uh, study that that's different than a treatment seeking group that goes to a place and they're only given one option. These people had an option before they ever signed up to go to their doctor's office or to come to this computer treatment program. There was another thing that we did that I think may have affected the sustainability, that is people staying with the program. And that is, recall those three data points at screening. We screened people for two times and then they came in for the third data point on their depression scores. So we had three points because we didn't want to have people dropping off, I mean, becoming undepressed, not as a result of something we did, but because life got better or something, and so after the first session, their scores are changing. We wanted people who were stable depressed so that we could show whether the program worked. Well, when you think about it, if a depressed person can come back for three straight weeks <laughs> for assessments to interact with somebody, that shows a level of motivation, I think, that may not be, well, I can't say if it's typical of all depressed people, but it's, it's a statement. It speaks to their commitment. They're likely to stay with it if, they've, if they knew about it, as you said, at the very beginning, and now they've come back three times to, to go with it over a three-week period of time. Do you see what I'm saying? If they had come just one time, a, a low-effort response, to try it out, it's a novelty and stuff, well, that's pro that may be a different group. Uh, researchers have to be cognizant of all of these issues in terms of describing who they treated in studies like this. There's a, a depression study that's well known for having had people submit data about their daily activity ex uh, exercises for two solid weeks every day before they could get into the study. Well, that's a different group than obese people who don't have that discipline to, to do that. So at the end of that stuff, they had a group of people who were highly motivated stuff to, to do so. 
Studies have been done to show that in depression in particular, there's a group of people who have also low self-esteem, quite that's sort of related to, but not the same as depression, who don't want to change. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that <laughs> looks like we're at the, uh, who are not motivated to do things. If I could get you undepressed by touching you or something, they'd be cool with that. But if they got to do some work for it, I, it's too much work. So thank you all for coming. And I'm sorry, there was a.